Today, we are honored to be at the Biltmore State, located in Asheville, in the state of North Carolina. Today, Hank and I are in Louisville, Kentucky, and we are super excited to be visiting Churchill Downs, the site of one of the most popular and exciting annual sporting events in the whole world, the Kentucky Derby. Today's show is going to be really sweet because Hadley and I have traveled to New Hampshire to learn about how maple syrup is made. Today, Hadley and I are super excited to be in Boston, Massachusetts to learn about the science of sugar and the chemistry of baking with the Flour Bakery's owner and pastry chef. Today, Hadley and I are in Monticello, the historic home of Thomas Jefferson. We are standing on the side of Monticello, which faces west. This is the vantage point of Monticello depicted on the reverse side of the nickel. We're very excited about today's show because we're going to be going on the road again. And this time our travels are taking us to an amazing food destination. One of the culinary jewels in the Mediterranean crown, Greece. Today we traveled all the way up the east coast to the state of Maine. Maine is a pretty amazing place. One thing you can't help but notice when you get to Maine is the interesting and unusual names for many of the towns and geographical locations. Hi, I'm Hadley. And I'm Delaney. And this is Twice, Twice as Good. We know many of you love school. And love to cook. But did you know that many subjects kids study in the classroom have a lot to do with cooking too? And that's especially true of the STEM subjects. STEM, S-T-E-M, stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Every recipe is a math equation, and one which often involves a lot of fractions. And when you cook, there's always something scientific going on. Technology has made modern cooking a snap. And smartly engineered tools help us cook more safely and efficiently. Now, just because the school day's over doesn't mean you have to stop learning. So for today's show, we thought we'd serve up some simply amazing after-school snacks with a heaping helping of learning on the side. Just think of it as extra credit that tastes extra good. So this is our hydroponic lettuce where we grow it in these big raceways. They hold about 2,500 gallons of water with the nutrients in it for the lettuce to grow. Hydroponics is a method of growing plants using mineral nutrient solutions in water, but without soil. And this is some romaine lettuce that's been in here for about four weeks. And we're gonna harvest it today. Okay. So I'll let you take the knife okay. and just fold it back and just saw it right off, just like that. And we seal it up in this nice, clean plastic bag to protect it. It's ready to go to our chefs. And then this afternoon or this evening, it could be on your dinner table. Next, we're gonna make our strawberry and petite green salad. The greens that you got from uh, Mr. Eli over at the farm. We have some local strawberries here. We need to make our dressing first. So we're gonna go ahead and add our white balsamic vinegar. So we'll put one cup of strawberries in the dressing. We call this lavender honey. So the bees that made this honey uh, used uh, lavender flowers to make it. Next, uh, we're gonna add a shallot. Start with a low speed, so it doesn't come flying out of the blender. Yes. And slowly turn it up. We slowly add in our oil, a little bit of olive oil. So we're gonna put the dressing, just a few strawberries. So we're gonna make what's called a fresh cheese, or it's also called ricotta. Take whole milk, we're gonna bring it up to a boil. So once it comes up to a boil, the whole milk, we're gonna add the juice of two lemons. As we add the lemon juice, you'll slowly start to see the curd separate from the whey. Whey is the liquid remaining after milk has been curdled and strained. Sweet whey is the byproduct of making certain hard cheeses like cheddar or Swiss cheese. Sour whey is the byproduct produced during the making of yogurts or cottage cheese. All right, so we add the lemon juice to the milk and then the curd separate from the whey. So that's gonna be our cheese for a salad. So what we're gonna do is slowly ladle that through our cheesecloth. So for a gallon of milk, you end up with about a pound of cheese. And we're gonna add a little bit of this warm ricotta on top or fresh cheese. Are these edible flowers? They are edible, the pansies are. And what I like to do is clean up the rim a little bit. That looks really good. 
Derby Day in the infield, there's certainly a bunch of celebrating. If you really want to see the horses run, you have to be in the grandstands. The Derby draws an average of about 150,000 visitors every year. That's a lot of hungry spectators. Good thing we're meeting with Chef Dave next to learn how he does it. Now, Chef Dave's going to show us how to make the most famous drink in the Kentucky Derby. Well, you can't come to Churchill Downs without having a mint julep. So today, we've got a special version of the mint julep we're making just for you girls. So we started this one off with equal parts sugar and water. We brought it to a boil, and then we pulled it off the heat, and we added a bunch of fresh mint. So I've got a ton of mint here. We have our own mint farm where we work with here because we sell so many of these. On Kentucky Derby Day, we make about 120,000 of these mint juleps. So we start off, we make this mint syrup. We put the mint in there, we put it in the cooler, we let it sit for about an hour, and then we strain it out. All mint juleps have crushed ice. So we're gonna start off by putting a little bit of crushed ice in here, okay? And then we're gonna give it a little bit of the mint syrup. Do you have to do this all in the right order? Yes, and we have a whole group of people that on Derby Day, this is all they do. And then normally, we pour uh, a little Kentucky <laughs> bourbon, but today, we're topping these off with lemonade. Because I think mint and lemonade are two unbelievably good flavors together. And now what we're gonna do, just like we do at the Derby, we top it off with a little ice, we put kind of a little ice cone on top there, right? Yes. We're wow. gonna take a big sprig of fresh mint. We put that in like that. That looks really pretty. Put that in like yeah. that. So here we go, we'll finish these off. And here are your very own mint juleps. Wow, thank you. Cheers. Thanks for coming out today. I hope you had a great time here at Churchill Downs. Thank you. Yeah. As you've probably guessed, maple syrup is made from the sap of maple trees. Sap is fluid that's transported through the tree that brings it water and essential nutrients. Both people and trees use a vascular system, which means they rely on veins to distribute essential nutrients. The sap found in North American trees in places like New Hampshire, Vermont, upstate New York, and Canada, where the climate gets very, very cold in the winter, is what we'll be looking at today. That change in seasons is crucial to maple syrup production. As the temperature drops, trees, including maple trees, start to store up a whole bunch of starch in their roots and trunks kind of like how a bear stocks up on food before he hibernates to keep his body nourished as he sleeps through the winter. In the spring, the starch gets converted to the sugar that provides the trees with energy. As the seasons get warmer, it starts to flow upward from the roots and trunk towards the branches. That's just a little bit of the science that explains how the sugar gets into the tree, but the history of how it got out of the tree and onto your table is pretty fascinating too. This right here is a sugar maple. It's a hard, hard maple tree. We take our drill. Wow, amazing. We go about an inch and a half deep. So after we drill the hole, we just set the tap in. You can see the sap coming out. And we just push it in a little bit and we give a little tap. So you'll set the bucket on here, and you'll be able to hear it hit the bucket. Hear that? Oh, yes, yeah. like a tiny Yeah, tiny. so when I walk by in the morning, if I hear that, I know the sap is running. Once the maple syrup gets harvested, this is the place it ends up for processing, the sugar house. Today is all about showing you how dinner was prepared in Jefferson's time at Monticello, and what it would be like to be a visitor for dinner at this historical place. And since all great meals start with healthy ingredients, we're heading out to the world-famous Monticello Garden to see the fruits and vegetables of Thomas Jefferson's labors. So this garden is three football fields long. Wow, that's really big. That's giant. Yeah, it's about two acres or a thousand feet. You really can't see from one end to the other. The advantage of growing your own vegetables is that you are picking them as fresh as they can be. These, these are going to be minutes old when you bring them to your table to make a salad. What was one of Thomas Jefferson's favorite vegetables? 
Well, we happen to have some peas here and Jefferson grew 22 different kinds of peas. So then if you put those in the ground, look what happens. It's fat, it's swollen, and then look at these funny things off the bottom. They're roots, and then the top is the pea plant. So if you put a thimble full of lettuce seed, everyone could measure it. Every woman and child would have a thimble, and some men did too because everyone knew how to sew. So here's a thimble full of lettuce. Each one of those seeds will be an entire head of lettuce like right oh in front of us. And that's only a baby. So if you spill it out in your hand, and then take a little pinch, like if you're going to put sugar on a cookie, you just put, put it like this. Lean into the trench, okay. right under the string. And once you're finished, then you can take a little soil and toss it over the top. And you can pat it in right under that string. 25% of all blueberries grown in America are grown in Maine. We're here in the town of Limerick at Libby and Son You Picks with Aaron Libby to learn more about blueberries. Blueberries have adapted well to Maine's naturally acidic and low fertile soils and challenging winters. Were blueberries originally grown in the U.S. or were they brought here? They are native to North America. In fact, they're one of three berries that are native to North America, the cranberry and Concord grape as well. How do you know when blueberries are ready to be picked? Well, I mostly go by the color of the blueberries when it's nice and blue, nice and big and plump. What kind are these? These right here are blue crop variety. It's one of the 12 varieties that we have. Are there blueberries on these plants right now? Well, the early stages of them, actually. As you can see the plant here, see the flowers? These will get pollinated, and you see these little green here? These are actually the, what is going to become the blueberries. So after this blossom here gets pollinated, it'll drop off, and this is the early starts of the blueberries. In a few weeks, it'll turn into those nice, big, plump blue ones. Can you freeze blueberries to keep them longer? Yes, actually, blueberries are one of the best freezers of all the berries. Just make sure you don't wash them before you freeze them. The thin white coating that you see on blueberries and other fruit seals in the freshness and helps keep in the fruit's moisture. The bloom is a sign of freshness since it fades with time and handling. But it's still wise to wash produce thoroughly before eating. Where does the start come from? Well, that's the end of the stem where the stem connects to the vine. And actually, the Native Americans used to call these star berries because of that star shape. Good for you, too. Why are they good for you? Well, blueberries are superfood with a pack full of antioxidants that are great for your brain, for your eyes, for your immune system, and they have cancer fighters in them as well. Now that we've learned about blueberries, we're ready to use them with Mrs. Bonzer in Maine Diner's famous blueberry pie recipe. So we start off with the fresh blueberries. Then if you want to add sugar, so for one pie we use two-thirds cup of sugar and then a tablespoon of lemon juice, and then a half of a teaspoon of cinnamon. And then all we do is we kind of mix that up a little bit. And then what we end up doing is we cook that down into a compote. So while the blueberries are cooking, we can actually put the crust into the pie plate. Then we fill it up with blueberries, which I actually already have some finished here. Then we do the same thing with this top crust. I have one that's finished. So we'll cut this. Well, I hope that you like it. Yeah, that looks really good. Let's try it. Mmm, this is really good. Really good.